Welcome to Refactor This, sponsored by vFunction. In each episode, we talk application modernization tools, concepts, and advice with industry experts. My name is Oliver White, and today I'm joined by Simon Ritter. Simon is a Java champion and deputy CTO of Azul Systems, whom he represents on the JCP Executive Committee as well as JSR expert groups. Having joined Sun Microsystems in 1996 and staying with them through the Oracle acquisition for nearly 20 years, I'm very excited to talk to him today about his ideas and perspectives on modernization. So Simon, thanks for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, aside from uh, my my basic quick intro, is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm sure you've done more uh, than what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things where you start thinking about your career and, and there's a lot to it. But uh, no, I think that, that kind of covers it. Obviously, uh, I've been doing Java really from the very beginning. 1996 was when shortly after Java was launched. And I think I joined Sun literally about a week before a week after JDK 1.0 was launched. So mm. I kind of followed it all the way through its history. That's excellent. Well, happy to have you here. Um, I've longed to know, what does a deputy CTO do? And I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but for example, I, I, I don't recall ever seeing a deputy CFO or a deputy CMO. Uh, what's different about the CTO office, let's say, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, likes to have a deputy when when possible? Yes, it's, it's one of those things that is a kind of a weird job title isn't it and the way i like to describe it when people say what's a deputy cto i say well i'm i'm the understudy to the real cto the apprentice um, but that's the CTO. the apprentice yeah, yeah. i mean it, it's not quite like that i mean i do two things really in terms of the cto type stuff i fill in for our real cto gil Tene, um from time to time because there are things that he should be doing really but he doesn't have the time for so things like the, the jcp things like the the jsr expert group those are the types of activities that i fill in for him but a lot of what i do is more around the sort of technical marketing developer relations advocacy kind of thing mm -hmm. and i'll be honest you know deputy cto sounds a little bit better than you know dev, developer advocate so when you're talking to management people especially for more commercial discussions. Uh, it's more of a sort of job title to make me sound a little bit better than I am. Mm. Well, that makes sense to me and, and hopefully everyone listening. <laughs> so let's jump into it. What's the first thing that comes to mind for you when somebody says, Simon, I need you to, I need you to help me modernize my, my aging architecture. I've got legacy systems, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what pops to mind for you? I think that the, the the one word that springs immediately to mind is microservices, and then yeah. second word will be cloud. <laughs> microservices in the cloud solution. Good. Exactly. Yep. Job done. Yes. So I mean, obviously, what we're seeing is that everybody's moving to the cloud. Um, well, not everybody, but almost everybody's moving to the cloud, because in theory. It gives you a utility-based pricing model, which then leads to better pricing and better sort of return on investment for the, the money that you're using, mm -hmm. rather than you having to go out and buy and provision all the hardware for your data center. You let somebody else do that, and you just pay for what you actually use. And the, the problem with that is that sometimes people take that assumption and they, they run with it, but then they find they're actually spending more on their cloud bill than they were on their own data center. And that's where right. you start getting into the idea of, oh, hang on, what's going on and, and looking at how you've got to plan that. So modernization, it's very, very important to plan how you're going to make that shift to the cloud and how you're going to use microservices effectively. So, um... We, we kind of hear the terms migration and modernization <clears throat> uh, used uh, perhaps interchange interchangeably at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the surprise cloud bill is, would you define that as a result of migration without modernization maybe? Yes, definitely. Because if you think of migration, what you're doing is the, the sort of lift and shift idea. You take your application right. that's been running in your data center and you just move to somebody else's data center, which is in the cloud. And if you're not making any changes to the way that application works, then you're going to suffer exactly the same problems that you have with that application running in your own data center. 
where if we look at the type of architecture that people are using, it's going to be typically monolithic architecture. Mm -hmm. And monoliths, as we know, one of the big advantages of switching to a microservice architecture is that you can scale sections of your application independently and have those be very dynamic in response to changing workloads. But with a monolithic application, you just don't have that ability. So you have to over-provision on the cloud, just in the same way you have to over-provision in a, your own data center. If you do, rather than a migration, you do a modernization, then what you're talking about is say, okay, let's sit down, let's re-architect our application, break it down into those services, then have those moved to the cloud and take advantage of the fact that we can spin up microservices, we can shut them down very dynamically as we need those things. And we only use the resources we actually require to run that application. So that's the big difference to me. Yeah, I, I would say that that's pretty concise and I think covers covers the area. You, you make it sound pretty straightforward and easy though. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, for, for someone who, uh, who who entered the scene with JDK 1.0? Um, how do you how do you describe this uh, process to to a large enterprise that has Java EE six and WebSphere, and they they want to they want to go to the cloud with microservices just like you described? Yes, and certainly as you quite rightly pointed out, I've made it sound very easy. You just go, okay, let's switch to microservices tick in the box, job done. But it's far more complicated than that. And moving to microservices is something which requires a lot of analysis and a certain amount of skill as well. And hopefully, you know, if you're going to do that kind of modernization, you'll find people with the experience of having done that before rather than trying to start it on your own mm -hmm. and have your developer team just start from scratch. And the reasoning behind that is that if you look at moving to a microservice architecture, you're saying, okay, let's break it up into services, but how many services do you break it up into? What granularity do you use for those services? Because you could say, well, let's keep it really kind of big and chunky and take a big monolithic application and we'll break it down into you know four or five services, which might be too big and not granular enough. And then you lose that benefit of the, the sort of scalability that you have versus you can go the opposite direction. You can say, right, every single thing is going to be a different service. Hmm. And you end up with hundreds, even you know, more than hundred services. Microservice the... uh, multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And the then you run into all sorts of problems with the coordination and the orchestration of those services and trying to make everything work together. And that becomes very problematic as well. I've certainly done a number of presentations where I've talked about microservices and polled the audience on how many microservices they tend to use in a given application. Mm. And it seems that if we take a sort of random population of people who are doing this, the sweet spot seems to be in the sort of like a couple of dozen mm -hmm. microservices. Obviously, it depends a lot on what you're trying to do in terms of the application. But what most people seem to think is that if you're using you know, between, let's say, 10 and 40 microservices, that's probably about the right number. More than that becomes unmanageable, or not unmanageable, but hard to manage. Less than that, you start to lose the benefits. And I, I, one of the things that is really important to say about this as well is when we talk about microservices, it's sometimes very misleading and people kind of get drawn into that idea that, ooh, micro service, micro from the Greek meaning small. So right. we must be talking about small services. Let's make things small. But the reality is that what we should really call them is like mono services or uni services. What we're dealing with there is the idea of do one thing and do it well. So it doesn't mm. matter what that one right. thing is, but focus on that as a single service. And if you think about like Cassandra, Cassandra is a NoSQL database, it's a web persisting data. Great, that's a big chunky piece of software, but you could treat that as one service. And that's still a microservice because it's delivering one thing and one thing well, which is the persistence of your data. But it doesn't have to mean that you're then making that service very small in terms of the, the actual footprint. So th this is one of those things that people, as I say, sometimes get misled by saying, oh, microservices must be small. 
Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I've heard this before as well. The, the idea that it should be small and, and also small in terms of what lines of code or mm -hmm. volume or expected throughput, that sort of thing. I doubt any of the uh, Netflix microservices out there are, are small in any mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, exactly. reasonable yep. definition. Um, so these are these are some good points. Again, you're you're laying out this this very uh, sunny sky uh, version. It's it's clear you have a lot of experience in this. Um, we had we did a survey a little while ago that essentially showed that four out of five modernization projects fail uh, to achieve their objectives, and it costs mm -hmm. over a million dollars on average and takes over a year on average. Mm -hmm. Um, in the report, there's some uh, data about why things why things fail. When you've seen projects throughout your career, what are what are some let's say reoccurring themes that you've noticed either in the failure or success of of a modernization project, or just maybe not even modernization necessarily, just regular coding and and you know <laughs> building and deploying. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of things there that I can think of. I mean, one of them we've already kind of covered, which is when you architect your solution, you go one, you go either extreme in mm -hmm. terms of your microservices, so too few or too many. That can definitely lead to problems, um, which then manifest themselves in terms of the, the project not working in the way you want it to. But I think also it's it's often quite difficult because when you're taking an existing piece of software and you go, okay, how do we modernize that? How do we turn it into something different? It can be very complicated because often the people who wrote that application originally no longer work for your organization. So a lot of the ingrained knowledge that you would have had from the, the sort of subject matter experts has disappeared. And if you bring in new people to start looking at that code, we all know what it's like when you read other people's code even when you read your own code that's been written you know well only a few weeks ago but certainly if it's right. it's certainly if it's years ago and you come back to your own code or, or anybody else's code it can be quite difficult to try and figure out exactly what they intended to do with that sure you know hopefully it's well documented you know we all document our code very carefully and put very good comments in make sure that everybody can understand what we're doing uh, and so on but it can very it can be very difficult to take existing code and then say, right, how do we migrate this to or modernize it into a, a different type of application? I mean, one of the things actually coming back to what you said earlier, because you mentioned Java EE 6 and how would you approach that? At least with Java EE, you do have a bit of a chance because you can think of enterprise Java applications you've got the application server which runs as a container and then you've got your sort of servlets and you've got your um java beans the enterprise java beans and those are already giving you some ideas about how to break up the elements because you'll have servlets which provide the sort of um view of your data mm -hmm. and then you'll have your enterprise java beans session beans the uh, entity beans if you bother to use them not many people use entity beans but you certainly can have that as a way of breaking things up and you can say okay well i've got that service let's make that a service i've got that um session bean let's make that a service so that gives you a starting point and that's why moving enterprise java applications into a microservice architecture may actually be easier than if you've got a big monolithic chunk of java that's just doing one big thing um so there, there are things like that but yes in terms of the, the challenges it is about how do you look at that code and then migrate it in or modernize it i should say into microservices and break it up along well-known boundaries and have good interfaces and things like that um when you that 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 makes yeah that's an interesting point sorry i was i was reflecting on the um or the existing uh, profile or, or rather setup of Java EE in the way that could lead people in the right direction. Um, have you ever encountered a situation where manual efforts have become, uh, have taken too long or have you ever actually tried to look at a very, very large and complex Java app and 
attempt to do manual refactoring and how far were how far have you seen people get <laughs> yes i mean i i think back to some of the stuff i have worked on and i know that i've actually worked on some projects where we completely failed um Hmm. Not through any fault of my own, but, um, but you were was... sick that you were sick that day. I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> but but it, it was it was actually um, even though we we had some well versed people in the architectures and we had some some very good Java programmers, it was more of a sort of I think in the specific project I'm referring back to, it was more of a sort of management failure, if anything, because mm. they they sort of wanted to go in one direction. And we were sort of saying, well, let's sort of do it this way. And they kind of tried to force us into a slightly different direction, which then meant we were sort of trying to fit it into what they wanted. And that really didn't work. So that there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely challenges from that perspective in terms of thinking about how, how much code to work on and the direction you go in. So having having everybody uh, involved in the in the project on the same page, let's say, mm -hmm. yeah, with yes. goals and under understanding well developed, yeah, mm -hmm. this is something that definitely makes sense. Um, switching gears just a little bit, what do you think of when you hear the term technical debt? <laughs> yes, technical debt. One of those, it's basically old code, isn't it? Um, I think it is where you're dealing with a situation that, that people have developed code that's working and you need to modernize it or enhance it. So you're either looking to move it to a different architectural approach or you're simply looking to update it to support new functionality. And technical debt is where you have to work with the existing code. And that, as I say, can often be a challenge because if you haven't been, if you're not the person who wrote it and the person who wrote it doesn't work for your organization anymore, you're kind of looking at it from, you know, a, a, a perspective where you don't have a lot of knowledge about the exact way that that code was written. And that's, to me, is where tech debt comes in because you've got to look at it. There are other aspects to that as well um, because if you've uh, used an old approach, then that could be considered technical debt as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of an example there, but if, if you've applied, you know, an old style technique to doing it, solving a problem, I mean, let's use um, reactive as a, as a good example. So reactive is a more modern way of doing things and doing things asynchronously. Mm -hmm. If you've used an old approach where things are done synchronously, then that's definitely technical debt. And if you want to try and move it to an asynchronous approach, um, that becomes very difficult. Well, it, it has it's a lot of challenges the versus uh, if you've done everything asynchronously from the beginning. So I, I think that's another good discussion about um, technical debt is how the, the architecture has been approached initially. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the different flavors of technical debt. So perhaps something like architectural debt mm -hmm. uh, is one. I think um, when developers think of technical debt, they often maybe the first thing that comes to mind is they come across some code and it's just indecipherable and it's unclear why it's there. What are some, what are some other examples of technical debt that you might have, have come across in your time? What's, what's a, let's say, what's a, a very uh, common scenario that a, a, an everyday developer might uh, confront and, and realize it's technical debt? Hmm. Um... The horror stories around technical debt usually center around a, a, a well-intentioned but junior developer who makes a change on a Friday and uh, yes. it and suddenly none of the data layer works and <laughs> the CEO is getting uh, phone calls at midnight and that sort of thing. Yeah, I suppose that that's more to do with, uh, or the, the way I look at that is more to do with ensuring that you have adequate testing of mm -hmm. your code. So before you put something into production, you run all of your unit tests and you run your uh, regression tests against your application before you deploy it into production. So if somebody does come along and make a, a, a big change to the way things work and suddenly, as you say, the data layer stops working, you know about that before you deploy it into production and suddenly all your customers uh, are no longer able to access the system. Um, yeah. Is technical debt something that you think can impact the ability to have good test coverage? I, 
I think technical debt, that's another aspect of technical debt, because if you mm. don't have good test coverage, that you could consider as technical debt because you're not able to prove the functionality of, of the code. And if you are modernizing or even migrating, then not having adequate test coverage is going to provide you with many more significant challenges than if you mm. are able to prove the functionality of, of the different components. That's why unit testing is, is absolutely critical. And you know, test-driven development is uh, an interesting approach. But of course, that's that's much more modern. Didn't use that sort of twenty years ago. Well, at least mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah, we may need to start saying thirty years ago. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's pretty late in the year. Uh, let's talk a little bit about tools, uh, concepts, paradigms, uh, training courses. You know, that sort of thing. Um, what's out there that you would recommend to people and and that have been helpful to you, perhaps? Um, I think probably the, the, for me personally, the, the biggest thing is obviously an IDE and the IDE is going to be the thing that makes you more or less productive. So the, the more that the IDE does to help you, the more productive you're going to be in terms of using code. And I mean, I think back in my history of development and when I started out, there was no such thing as an IDE. Mm. I'm, I'm that old. So <laughs> there was no such thing as an IDE. It was, you know, I used to edit things with Vi and mm. then you'd run the compiler with the make file. And I mean, I can remember the first job I worked in. In terms of continuous integration and continuous deployment, the system that we actually put together, we had a, a group of us that were working on a, a project mm -hmm. and we were all editing the same source file set. So um, different set, different files, but within the same project. And what we would do is we, we, we found that there were certain files that were being edited very frequently and to avoid the problems of not having uh, the ability to check in and check out code. What we ended up with was a table in the middle of our work area. And we had cards that we put on the table that had the name of the, the most commonly used files. If you wanted to edit that <laughs> file, you take the card out of the middle and then you had a make card. And so the idea was that when everybody put their make card in the middle, the last person to put the make card in ran the make script. <laughs> <laughs> Things have moved on since then. <laughs> yeah, it's like a manual git. <laughs> it was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is one of the, the things that I look at and I see that uh, developers today have, have it way easier than when I was a lad. Um, so yes, it, it is much easier to do things like continuous integration and continuous deployment because you can you know check out a source code file then you can you know, check it back in again or you can do pull requests and, and so on mm -hmm. if you're using uh, the Git type of approach. And you've got all the tools like Jenkins and so on that enables you to just say, okay, do my continuous integration and deployment stuff and, run all the tests, make sure everything passes before we actually deploy it. So th there's a lot of tools available to developers now for the whole process, all the way from IDE, just you know cranking out code through to the, the verification, the running the test suites, through to the deployment and so on. All of that kind of thing has been much, much more automated than it ever was when I started doing this kind of thing. And that really does help. Do you have a favorite IDE? I'm I'm gonna own up, and I'm gonna say that my favorite IDE is still NetBeans. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do use IntelliJ um, because I find that there are certain situations where IntelliJ is just a little bit ahead of uh, NetBeans in terms of supporting the most modern versions of Java, mm -hmm. and so I I tend to use uh, IntelliJ if I want to use you know the very latest JDK. But I still have a very soft spot for NetBeans from when I was at Sun Microsystems and uh, all of the sort of work that went through that. And it's one of those things that just feels comfortable when I use it. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I I did want to ask you a little bit about what Azul is doing because. Mm -hmm. You guys have been around for a long time. You've done, you have an excellent reputation uh, in, in the Java ecosystem. Uh, where are things now? Not really asking for a pitch, but you know, in terms of uh, the, the, pers the, the team looking to modernize their applications, um, can Azul help with anything specific that comes to mind? Yes, yes. I mean, we do only Java. So that's the sort of mm -hmm. first thing is we, we're just focused on Java. And really that sort of fits into two areas. And if we look at those two different areas, 
One of them is about providing a distribution of OpenJDK, which is great because lots of people want to continue using older versions of Java to run their existing applications. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at modernization, that's probably not where you would start looking. But the other side of what we, we're doing in terms of our business is around improving performance for the Java runtime. Mm. And that is where things that like modernization can come in. If you're switching to you know, microservices architecture, what you want to be able to do is to get the best possible performance out of those things. And also very important if you're doing Java is that warm up time that you get associated with mm -hmm. an application because you go from byte codes to compiled code using the JIT compiler. So what we've done is sort of focus on how do we improve that for applications running in the cloud and we do that in a number of different ways. So there's uh, a lot of sort of performance enhancements from the idea of replacing garbage collection. So we have truly pauseless, fully concurrent garbage collection. That's great. I, you know, eliminate latency in your application. Mm. But then we've also replaced part of the JIT compilation system using LLVM, which is an open source project. And what that allows us to do is to say, okay, if you're running in the cloud, what you're going to be able to do is get more throughput for the same set of resources. Coming back to what mm. we said right at the very beginning, you know, utility-based pricing model, if you can do more with the same set of resources, you can have less instances of that service, or you can provision smaller instances to run the same number of transactions per second. But the other thing that we've done, and this is sort of more, the most recent kind of thing that we're working on, is the idea of how to realize that the java virtual machine is running in the cloud and how can we take advantage of that mm -hmm. if you look at you know the jvm at the moment you run it in your data center from the jvm's perspective when it starts up it starts running your application and when you stop it that's it there's no memory of what happened there's no so we... state it's stateless let's exactly. say exactly yeah and that's that's bad for performance because of course if you take the same application you start it up again what you really like to be able to do is say well i remember all this stuff from when i did it before mm -hmm. all the code i compiled all the different things that i analyzed there and put profiling information why shouldn't i be able to reuse that again when i started up same application without changing it so what we've done is say let's take that JIT compilation that we have in the jvm and abstract it out and make it into a service in the cloud so you have mm. jit as a service that's a centralized service which then means that you can take advantage of a number of things such as memory you can cache the code that's being compiled you can even do that on a, a basis of using the profiling information because there are um, what are called speculative, opt speculative optimizations, and we can match speculative optimizations against compiled code. So even though it's the same method, you have a different profile that's being compiled against, and you can then reuse that amongst different JVMs. And also by centralizing it, you're putting all the resources in one place. You can then not have the load on each of those JVMs as it does its own compilation using those two V cores that you've got in your container. Now it's all in one place and it, it simplifies things a lot. So there's, so there's a lot of interesting things that we're doing there to help people modernize their applications and get better performance and take advantage of the um, the cloud so that you can reduce the prices that you're paying for your cloud infrastructure. And this is, uh, dare I say, this is something that people can implement without having to do a terrible amount of uh, modernization in advance? Exactly. See, because <laughs> if you want yeah. to, you can use all of this without doing any modernization at all. You can literally just say, okay, we've got the Java application, it's all compiled. Rather than running it on OpenJDK in the sort of vanilla form, let's run it on top of our platform prime, which is what we call it. And then you can take advantage of this plat uh, JIT as a service and all these performance enhancements without changing any of your code or even recompiling. So no modernization required, but if you want to modernize it, then you get the double benefit. Fascinating. Well, I'll be sure to leave uh, some, some uh, URLs from you in, in the show notes. Uh, final thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, remote employment and how how does this how do how do the human sides of, you know, building or modernizing applications play a role now, especially when the remote employee has become almost the norm for many uh, IT sectors, and mm. 
do you have any sort of career advice for people that are finding themselves in this kind of new new reality of remote remote work for uh, things that used to be really together in a team environment and in person? Mm. Mm. It is definitely a challenge because, as you say, if you're working in a team, what you really want to be able to do is to interact with the other members of your team because clearly you've got ideas, you've got problems that you're trying to solve and, you know, bounce things off each other to, to try and see where you're going. And of course, you need to have those regular meetings where you can sit in front of the whiteboard and you can, you know, go through what's happening and talk about, you know, the best approach and all that sort of thing. So that there's definitely challenges when you're working remotely. Sure, Zoom is is great in the sense that you can actually see people and it's a little easier to have interaction than if you're having a, a conference call. Better than uh, a fax it, machine. True. It's better than a fax machine. <laughs> better than a fax machine and, and better than just a conference call. But um it's still not as good, I find, in terms, especially if you're trying to interact on a project to make decisions about things. And even though you know there's lots of things if you look at Microsoft Teams and uh, various other pieces of software that Google produced you know we've got shared whiteboards and you've got shared documents so there is that ability to to edit from different places but it's still not quite as good as when you're sitting in a room with people and you know somebody goes up to the whiteboard and you know says oh no no let's do it that way and rubs it out and then uh you can start talking about it in terms of career advice yeah that's that's pretty difficult because i think the it's if you can figure out how to work in a remote team like that that brings a really big benefit to you know a future employer because you can say look you know i've worked on this big project we were all remote and we were still mm -hmm. able to deliver on it and it was successful so that that's you know, the kind of thing that you want to see from somebody's cv so uh, yeah but it's it's not easy to just go oh okay well i want to work on a successful project there we go <laughs> um but yes i think i think trying to focus on interacting with the other members of your team even if it's outside of like the sort of group meetings that you have and, and trying to to keep that thing going i mean you know, slack is you know a tool that lots of people use so making taking advantage of that is is very useful to you know get that individual thing where you've got a question you go oh yeah rather than sending an email use slack and you know have mm -hmm. a discussion going on there and again they provide lots of sort of tools around that to make that kind of interaction easier so i think if i was to give one piece of, of advice is look at all those tools that are available for interactive working remotely and try and figure out the best ways of using those for your own personality and also within a team. Excellent. Thanks. Well, Simon, it's been really great to talk to you today. I hope we get to meet again in person uh, at some point in the future. I, I always say that. Um, and for our listeners who'd like a little bit of fun at the end, we have a a lightning round of questions for Simon. Are you ready, Simon? Okay, yep. All right. What is the last song you listened to? Ooh, uh, I think it was an ACDC song, if I remember rightly, because I was on the plane this morning, and so I wanted something that would keep me awake. So, I, yes, it was In Rock We Trust, I think, off their, not maybe not their last album, but, but very recent album, yes. Excellent. What do you do to stay healthy? Um, I do a couple of things. I go to the gym. Uh, I try to eat healthy. And my son and I, uh, we do karate together. And uh, that was that was one of those things where it was like father son kind of thing. And uh, he started it initially because he was quite young. And then as he got a little bit older, I thought, hmm, I shall go and join him for that. And so yeah, we do that together, which is, uh, I really enjoy doing that. Has, has he beaten you yet in a match? <laughs> Many times. He likes hitting me. That's one of the great things about this. He gets a chance to punch dad. Well, after uh, punching each other out, uh, what is one of your favorite comfort foods to uh, console yourself with? Oh, uh, uh, I have to say, I, I do like a kebab, actually. Mm. Yes. A yeah. good kebab. All right. What is one of your favorite movies? Ooh, The Big Lebowski. Oh, yes, a classic. <laughs> the dude abides. <laughs> he does indeed. <laughs> what are, well, I normally ask what are three books everyone should read, but what's 
what's the first book you would recommend to a friend that you've uh, read recently? Um, haven't read it recently, but the one, one I would recommend to a friend is Cryptonomicron by Neil Stevenson. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Or The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson. Uh, Neil Stevenson is one of my favorite authors. He writes great books. Uh, and, and as a third one, um, The Martian by Andy Weir. I love that book. Ah, I haven't come across And in fact, any, any of his books, because uh, he's written three now, uh, they're all great. Uh, if you if you like science, uh, he's very good at sort of making it seem real. Well, programming is science, in my opinion. So, uh, would you ever allow a robot to perform dental hygiene or give you a haircut? Why or why not? Yes, yes, I would. Yes, because you would. Of the th yes, and the reason I say that is because you you only have to look at the way that there is uh, robotic surgery. So you can use robots to actually do surgery. Now, I know that's actually technically remote in the sense you've got a, mm -hmm. a surgeon who's controlling the, the the surgical instruments remotely, but it's still technically a robot. So yes, I, I, I would certainly let a uh, robot cut my hair because that wouldn't be too dangerous. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd let a robot, well, yeah, I guess uh, getting a robot to do my wasn't teeth. Sweeney, didn't Sweeney Todd come from around the corner <laughs> from you? <laughs> And last but not least, if we could bring back the T-Rex with cloning, would you vote yes or no to do it? I think I'd have to say no, um, because I think that's a bit dangerous going down that route. I would agree with you. Well, Simon, again, thank you so much for coming on to Refactor This today. It's been wonderful speaking with you, and uh, we will be uh, hopefully in touch again real soon. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Cheers.